Um, so we are talking this week about how to be creative with our kids. Um, and my name is Aubrey Page. I'm from the Change Starts Here Collaborative. I'm the CEO. And we work with parents and professionals to help um, teach them and give them different strategies to parent kids with neurodiversity. Um, and so this week when I was thinking about being creative, I was thinking about you because you use a lot of your, um, I don't know, you told me you're not a fun mom, but you totally look like a fun mom. <laughs> like, um, but you use your ideas as, as an occupational therapist to both teach your daughter, but also engage her in different creative ways. Because obviously if we were like, okay, sit here and do this thing, then our kids aren't excited <laughs> to do it. But you come up with a lot of really creative ways to, on how to engage with her. Um, so um, I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how us self-professed not fun moms um, could come up with some ideas on how to, to be a little bit more creative with our kids. Yeah, and so I think it's so important for me to just stress again out there why I always like come forward and be like, I'm not a fun mom, I'm not creative like this. I mean, I, I'll say I'm creative. I'm just a pretty lazy mom. Like I'm a play from the couch kind of mom. Yes. That's like, that's that my fun. style. <laughs> that's my style. I've got all the ideas for elaborate obstacle courses and scavenger hunts and all of these things. But I'm a pretty lazy mom. So I'm just telling moms out there, you can still be creative and not have all of the energy. I'm not a Pinterest mom. My playroom is not Instagram worthy, but all that matters is really the quality time that you spend with your kid. And even if it's at 10, 15, 20 minutes. And so I was trying to think of, of some general themes to encourage parents to be creative. And the number one thing that I can think of is to try to make anything a game. And the easiest way to do this, something that I do, that I used to do in the clinic, something, something that I do with um, Liliana is um, if you have a spinner or a dice, something to make something mm -hmm. random mm -hmm. out of any activity you can think of, cleaning up clothes. I'm going to roll this dice and you have to pick up three clothes in the room in 10 seconds. Ready, set, go. Just like time them. You can make them wow. clean things up like yeah. that. You could take, um, they have, you could like print out paper dice that are like foldable oh, okay. um, on teachers pay teachers. But I have this huge like foam dice that I got from, I think it was like target dollar section. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I put pieces of construction paper. So it's a color on each side instead of a number. Oh, right. And then whatever I roll a certain color orange that's how many you need to eat like two pieces of orange food if we're doing food exploring like there's adding a dice or like a time limit for some reason like that like makes it like a fun game and like encourages yeah. kids to do sometimes like non-preferred activities like cleaning up or trying something or putting things away but even just as any other any kind of game or activity you want to do in the house race them to do it, time them to do it, um, make like some random aspect. And that, that changes the whole thing for her. That's like a really, really easy thing that you can just add a dice or a timer to it. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that one thing that, um, this was a trick that we did in, in, um, when I was a field work student, which is basically the internship when you're an occupational therapist, when I was in the pediatric clinic, um, one of my challenges was using one game or one object, like a pillow if we're at home, or like an object would be like um, maybe one of those like robot arm grabbers or tongs, one mm -hmm. item. And in the clinic, it was how many different kids we could use that item with to use it for their specific goal that we were working on. But for okay. you at home, I would say, how many different ways can you use a toilet paper tube throughout the whole week? Like focus on one thing, yeah. whether, and, and just try to like, you could use it as a prop for pretend play. You can decorate it as a um, craft. You could use it as part of a STEM activity and see if you could like string paper through it, like so many different ways. But like, if you want to just focus on one object and think of how many different ways that you can use it, um, that's a great way as well. It forces you to to be creative because it's just the one thing. So you're like, um, it's a toilet paper tube. But. Exactly. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say is to, is to, this is something I'm working on too, is I often have 
<clears throat> something in my mind of what I want to do with her. Like some, there's things that I have interest in and there's things that she does. And sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they don't like she's mm -hmm. super into witches and potions and Halloween. And I have no idea where she gets that from. Cause that's <laughs> like not me at all. I do not like it. But um, I think sometimes parents, you know, like some moms, like I don't like playing cars, but my kid loves playing cars or I don't like dinosaurs, but my kid loves dinosaurs. But that's how you're going to really get them engaged but what I encourage is to find their theme activity toy character that they love and create a new game out of it so or activity or character out of it so for example she's really obsessed with like witches and potions like I said and she she'll play the same pretend play game with it she'll play the same characters um and my thing is I love um I like more structured play and like color, like coloring. I'm like, sit down, color with me. I can do that for hours. Yeah. Love coloring. So I printed out pictures of like witches and like magic potions and we colored and we mixed paint together. Like that magic aspect of like, mm -hmm. what does blue and yellow make? So it got her interest because it was like the activity that she, the, the theme that she liked, but to get me excited about doing it, I was like, how can I turn this into something that, I could be in interested as well. If you're a parent who has more tolerance for the play themes that your child likes, then just dive right in. But just find a way to to switch it up because that's how you're going to keep your child more engaged and to bring out more skills in them if they can be more flexible about new play themes, if they can add a new element to the play theme. That really s stretches their like executive functioning skills and a lot of different uh, developmental skills that are necessary. Um, so you don't, so it's not just you being creative, but you also kind of want to get that creative juices flowing for your, for your child as well to see if they could contribute anything new to the activity. Yeah, that's such a good point. Cause that's something I'm struggling right now with. We play the same thing every day. Yeah. All yeah. the time. Yeah. And like we're, we got to explore more, but I have to prompt that. So sometimes yeah. I'll challenge of like oh I wonder what it would be like if you did x y or z and I'm not necessarily there yeah. for the aftermath yeah. but um my kids are like twice as old as your kids so yeah um but that just to to get it stretched out I like this because I think a lot of us parents who are not particularly fun feel a lot of like shame over why can't I engage my kids so I like taking what they're really interested in a lot of our kids with neurodiversity have very like narrow fields of interest yeah. Um, and finding how to kind of merge the two. I thankfully have, um, my kids really like movies and I also do. And so that's one of our shared thing that we really love to do together. Um, yeah, I think it's also important though to, to mention because we're thinking of neurodivergent kids that when we're thinking about like a therapeutic play activity, which is just playing with your kid, but you kind of have like a goal in mind of like increasing social skills or executive functioning or fine motor or whatever it is. Um, there really is this big movement and the importance of play being child directed, right? Mm -hmm. And then when it's with an adult, and especially for trying to make it creative or change it up, then it does become a little bit more structured, which is something I personally always struggle with, because I've always got my OT hat on. And I'm like, how can I add a fine motor component to that? And I add structure to it. So that does take it a little bit away from child directed. Right. Um, so that's why it's important for me. And because I have a child who has anxiety and sensory processing disorder, we have so many different goals and skills that I'm trying to help um, bring out of her. But I don't do it at every play time. Like I have to yes. have in my mindset. All right, Monday today, she's in control, I'm going to do whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. I I have zero um, agenda. I don't care what she does. It's that Tuesday. I might be like, all right, well, I do want to like practice her flexibility a little bit. So I'm going to start to take the lead. So if, if you have a child with neuro who's neurodivergent and you have certain skills, it's good to keep those in mind. But it's also important to keep in mind that child directed play is also very, very, very important. And even though it feels like they're controlling us and we're seeing some of those habits and things that we're trying to want to stretch or change it's still important to their development for them to have that relationship with you with play that is that is controlled by them mm -hmm. and there's like a very fine line dance of adding your two cents into the play that still feels child directed 
not too much controlled. And I'm still learning that 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 is an art to be able to do that. Um, yes, but it's okay to have different goals for each play session, right? It's okay for us yeah. to be like, I'm going to play with you, but let's pick something mommy does right now, because that's practicing flexibility. But right. then there's times in your head where you're like, all right, I know my child really needs to feel in control. And they really need to be the teacher or the mommy in this game. And I'm going to let them boss me around for 20 minutes, yeah. because that's what they need. So it's just important to keep those things in mind when you're trying to be creative, but also remembering that child directed is really key for a lot of developmental um, learning. Yeah, and I find um, I've, as a foster parent, I've had a ton of kids in my home and a lot of them do play therapy, big fan. And so much of play therapy, child directed. And so sometimes I'll go in on sessions and it's very enlightening when they're in charge and they're saying to do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, oh, really? That's what they think? Like, yeah. <laughs> So I, yeah. I, although it feels like, oh, no, they're always trying to boss people around. We're trying to get them not to do that. And so maybe I shouldn't. But it is it's super helpful to un better understand our kids, which is the goal. I mean, we can't help them grow and learn new skills if we are just trying to make them mini us's. So um, exactly. And it's the same. It's funny because I it's just an, it's a new way that I've thought about play very recently because um, and it's, it's, it's very similar to sensory needs, right? Uh, if you are not looking at things from a sensory perspective, many caregivers, many teachers see a sensory seeking or a sensory avoiding behavior and they want to get rid of it. Right. Now, I don't want, I, I want you to sit still and not move versus right. when we have the education about how sensory processing challenges work and that they need that sensory input, we feed into it. They're, they need to move. Let's give them a way to move. It's the same thing with play. They need to feel in control. Let's let them fill that control bucket. But obviously, it's not going to be every single day they're in control. They do have to learn to be flexible. But we do need to feed into that and give them like that is their way of communicating. They need that to fill their certain their, that certain uh, need for them to just feel in control. Well, I think so. it's a healthy development, too, because we are teaching our kids that they have a voice and mm -hmm. um, that that matters um, and that they can help influence other things. And so although, yes, you don't want, like, in the middle of a parenting time, the kid to be like, well, mom, I think you should blah, 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 right? Like, that's not ideal. But um, I haven't found a lot of um, overlap between uh, parenting and, and these kind of play times, usually we're pretty good about separating, but even if yeah. we aren't, it's a good way to, it's a good discussion to have. My kids are old. I, ha I parent older kids cause I can have a full blown conversation yeah. with them about yeah. X, Y, and Z. So I just prefer that stage of parenting. But, um, so yeah, so I, 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 I don't see that as a, um, oh, well I let them do this in, in our play time. And so then they're doing it all the time. Um, but we, yeah, I haven't had that either. She, she can separate play from like, it's time to have dinner, like not, you know, she right. doesn't like kind of control that. I mean, of course, a lot of sensory kids need that element of control in terms right. of which chair do you want to sit in? Do you want Voices. to look up under the green pot? Oh, obviously, but um, it, what makes it easy for us is we're practicing this. We're practicing this a lot with pretend play because she really loves like having like certain animals and making them have a voice and like say a certain script. And she really mm -hmm. loves telling me what to do with a certain animal. Yeah. Um, and something that my play therapist, we are in play therapy right now. My play therapist has helped me with um, is that I am always like in character as Winnie the Pooh. So she can boss Winnie the Pooh and what he, what she wants Winnie the Pooh. No, you're supposed to say this. And I'll say, oh, I didn't know that I was supposed to say this. So she can kind of separate me from the character yeah. and she's still in control of the bear and what yeah. he says. And then we can separate it. And then if I need to like have mommy say something, I can like break character. I'm like, oh, sorry. Like I thought we were playing this. Yeah. So it's still like allowing her to control, but it's easier for her to separate controlling mommy versus like controlling a bear. And she still feels like she's right. in control. And so that's been a really nice separation for me. Um, I know it's not always possible when you're not doing pretend play, if they're just like telling you like where to put like a block, right? Yeah, if you're like right. playing blocks, but um, that's something that's helped us a lot. Well, and maybe that that family, if that's what they're struggling with, can create some persona that's like playtime mommy. It's like a totally different person than exactly. the parenting mom. Um, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I think these are great ways to empower us as parents to um, to get involved. And so and so much of what you teach, I love because it's not just we're playing for the sake of play. Of course, that has its time and place, as we've discussed here. But we're also playing 
with the intention intention of growing and stretching skills, which is why I like watching movies with my kids because I always pick movies that have some kind of lesson in it. Um, so just the other day, we watched The Greatest Showman for uh, many times. We've watched that. And um, I said, what was the lesson? And they said, oh, the lesson is to accept people even if they're different. I said, but, but what did the guy who ran the circus learn? And it took us like 10 minutes to get to the right answer. Like but right. that discussion was helpful for them and they can visualize it. And so I think there's lots of ways to engage with your kids and connect. Just this week, earlier this week, I was talking about how if your kids create something, which that's what my kids do that all the time, to, to listen to what they create or admire it and give very specific mm -hmm. feedback on what's nice about it. Because um, if you're like, oh, that's pretty, kids are like, okay, well, that was yeah. <laughs> like, they don't believe you. <laughs> um, but that way we can use that as a connecting opportunity also. Like, I care about what you care about, even if... Yeah. Like, for real, I don't want to sit there and talk for 30 minutes about X, Y, or Z. Um, but if you made that thing, I would really love for you to tell me more about it. And there's there's boundaries, obviously. We can't. Um, my kids, um, kids with, so I, I primarily advise families who have kids that have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is the most common form of developmental disabilities affecting 5% of the population, which makes it two and a half times as common as autism. And a lot of our kids have sensory processing challenges. Mm -hmm. And so um, like us, it, most of the challenge is us learning how to help them get the sensory input they need. Um, yeah. you know, some are avoidant, but a lot of, a lot of them are seekers. And then of course you can be seeking and avoidant on the same thing. Totally. On the same day. Totally. So sometimes it's just, it's just to guess, but um, so, so helping those kids who may be perseverating or fixating on one topic and talking about it continuously. Um, how do we help parents um, kind of, you know, engage that and, and encourage that love. Like we don't want our kids to not love that thing. But right. So get us involved. These, you have given some really great tips on how to yeah. make that happen. Yeah. Okay. So tell us how to connect with you. What ways that people can learn more from you? I want to know. Yeah. So I am obviously on Instagram as the OT butterfly, but I have a parent membership and course specifically for parents who have kids with sensory sensitivities. So as Aubrey kind of mentioned, you can have children who have a mix of seeking behaviors or also avoiding behaviors, which is also what we kind of call sensory sensitivity. Um, but if you have a child who has a hard time with things like getting dressed, with picky eating, with loud sounds, um, with messy play or busy environments, I have a four-step process that helps you kind of introduce those sensory challenges in the what I call the just right challenge um, ladder method that I've helped with uh, that I've used with my own clients in occupational therapy and use with them at home in a home program. Um, and it's a parent membership, so we kind of support each other. I am I facilitate the community, but I'm also one of the members because I have a daughter with sensory processing yeah. disorder and anxiety, so I, I get it. And I kind of created this group for myself. Mm -hmm. And also just because I love connecting with parents and hearing their stories. And I my heart breaks for parents who, who fall in this category of just sensory processing disorder that do not have autism or ADHD, or any of the other bigger uh, diagnoses mm -hmm. that can recognize sensory processing disorder, because right now the medical community is a little behind in acknowledging <laughs> SPD's um, existence on its own. So there's a lot of parents who are just like, I can't get help because my doctor said my son doesn't have autism, but yet he's only eating five foods. He will wear shorts in the middle of winter. Like there's clearly something very, very wrong. So if that sounds like you and you would like help with sensory processing sensitivities and all of that, you can um, DM me on Instagram, but you can also check out my website that has a lot of resources for parents. You can go to sensorywisesolutions.com, which is the name of my membership. And I have a lot of free resources and my free masterclass is there as well if you want to watch that. So lots of resources there, but I also just love connecting on Instagram. So come find me. Um, yes. I, and you have a lot of really great resources just in your feed. I, I did a, um, a, something on heavy work a couple weeks ago and I did some, I did some research on your page. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. yes I love that. Um, your masterclass, what is the topic of that? So my masterclass is four steps to help your child through sensory sensitivity. So I really break down my four steps. That's part of my signature method. Yeah. And I show you how you can apply it at home if you want. I, I tell you every single step that I use um, and how you can kind of how you can formulate the right goal for your child. Um, 
of where you want to go and then how you can find their baseline level and really, really be explicit in that. And then so that you can kind of bridge the gap using yeah. the just right challenge method. So it's really kind of um, a sneak peek into my program if you're curious of what that is. But you yeah. I've had parents who just take the master class and are like this, like I've already made huge progress from just watching that. So if you want to find that you can go to the OT butterfly.com slash masterclass. Okay. Um, and then if all of this is just hard to remember, then you can always DM me. That's easiest. And I can direct anyone to the to the resources. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. I super appreciate it. You're a great asset to our community. And um, you're really you provide a lot of really practical tips that I well, I think they're super practical. And I appreciate I am, that a super lazy mom also. So. Yes, um. lazy moms <laughs> unite. Like you do not have to have all of this like crazy energy at Pinterest. You could still be a great mom from mm -hmm. the couch. Yes, yes. <laughs> that looks really fun over there, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate yes. it. Yes, thank you for joining us. I'll post this and then we'll share away. Perfect, okay. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.